at the top of the hour. So let's just go ahead and dive right in. Um, my name is Joseph Garcia and I'm gonna be your host today. Um, I am a team member on the Meta program here at TechSoup. And we have a very exciting webinar for, for our members today. Today's webinar is all about how nonprofits are using virtual reality to grow their impact. So before we get started, let's just go ahead and just cover a few housekeeping keeping, uh, rules. Just as a reminder, this event is going to be recorded and we are going to email the slides, the recording and any resource links within three business days after this webinar. There are two ways to engage in this webinar. There is a Q&A button function that is at the top of your Zoom um, application and you should see it there. And then you also see a chat button as well. Those are great. Those, both of those will work out great. I have um, my, my colleague in the chat that's gonna help me field these questions, Chloe. And um, yeah, feel free to, to engage with the webinar, ask questions. We are gonna save all questions to the end of this webinar. So if you do have one that is, is burning, just type it in the chat room and we will we'll try to address it um, when we have our Q&A section. And last but not least, I just want to mention that this, that if you need closed captioning, you can turn on the CC closed captioning using the button located in the Zoom menu. All right. So today's agenda. Today we are going to include a welcome and introduction, which are already halfway through. We're going to hear insights from a VR expert. We're gonna hear two amazing case studies and how they use virtual reality within their organization. We're gonna discuss the meta program via TechSoup and just give, you, just give you an overview of the offerings and what is available to nonprofits. And last but not least, we, would, we are gonna have a Q&A session where we can answer any and all questions around virtual reality um, and, and how, how, how it can help benefit your organization. So today's speakers, um, let me introduce our guest speakers for the day. First, we're gonna hear from Beth Murray. Beth Murray, they're a global lead for, non for the nonprofits program at Facebook Meta, running programs that support nonprofits to thrive in the meta metaverse. Then we're gonna hear from the founder and president of Vehicles in for Change, Martin Schwartz, who has changed the lives of over 29,000 individuals, awarding over 8,000 cars. And lastly, we're gonna hear from Christy Nellermore, who is currently a training officer for Emerging Technology on Switchboard, a project implemented by the International Rescue Community, IRC, that provides comprehensive support and guidance to professionals and organizations involved in refu refugee resettlement. Um, Christy is gonna be joined with a co-presenter today, Mal Malad Mazari, and they are joining us from the University of Utah. So let's go ahead and let's just jump right in. Please welcome our first speaker today, Beth Murray. Thanks, Joseph, and hello to everyone. Uh, to introduce myself, I'm Beth Murray. I'm a global lead for nonprofit over here at Meta's Reality Labs. We're the part of Meta that thinks about developing and emerging technologies. We're focused on building what we call the world's next computing platform, or what you may know as the Metaverse. Before I worked uh, over here at Meta, I worked across nonprofits, businesses, and education. And my job just prior to this was as direction, a director of communications and fundraising in a charity. So hopefully I understand some of the challenges that you're tackling, and we'll talk a bit more about that later. My aim today is to help us all have a basic understanding of mixed reality technologies. I'm gonna explain what the metaverse is. Then I'm gonna talk about the kinds of technologies you can use to access it. And finally, I'm gonna give you some practical examples of how nonprofits across the world are using the metaverse to drive the delivery, awareness, and income. First of all, let's start with a history lesson. Technology has evolved fast over the past five decades. 50 years ago, we had those large site-specific computers. By the 80s, we had dial-up connectivity with that awful modem sound. And now 20 years later, we have access to the mobile internet through smartphones and tablets, which allow us to take our connections with us. When we got phones with cameras, the internet became visual and mobile. 
and we started to be able to use video as a much richer way to share things. And we believe that the metaverse is simply the next version of the internet that's going to enable even richer connections. So far, our relationship with the internet is looking at it. So most of our interactions are flat, they're framed, they're fixed, almost always brokered through a screen. It forces us to choose between our devices and our environment. But our belief is that from now on, you're going to experience the internet. You're going to be part of it. We will see this barrier between us and, and the internet dissolving over time as technology allows us to enhance the world around us whilst remaining completely present. And we believe you're going to be able to access these experiences from many different devices with a different level of definition and immersion. Some devices that exist today and others that we believe will exist in the future. We believe that this will be the basis of a new kind of computing platform as revolutionary as the PC itself. We believe that in the future you're going to be able to experience not just any place but any time, past, present or future. Take a beat and just imagine the potential for education. Imagine you're doing your history exams, but now you can experience standing on the streets of ancient Rome, hearing the sounds, visiting the local market to get a real sense of what life was like 2000 years ago. Imagine how much more compelling that would be than reading a textbook. Imagine a health researcher studying heart defects, being able to view a 3D image of a human heart, take it apart, explore that vascular system and come up with new ideas for treatment and surgery. Both of those examples are real and happening today. So today I'm here to talk about how nonprofits like yourselves are using the metaverse. But before I do that, let's delve a little into the technology so that we're all on the same page. We're going to talk about virtual reality, augmented reality and mixed reality. First of all, virtual reality, which we also call VR. Now that's the use of computer technology to complete and create a completely immersive simulated environment which can be explored in 360 degrees and I know that Marty will talk a bit more about how he's using that later. In VR you can interact with a virtual object or environment in a seemingly real way so you might be using devices or equipment like headsets, pressure sensitive gloves or bodysuits that let you see and feel the virtual world as though you're actually immersed in it. VR creates the sensation of being present in a virtual three-dimensional environment, allowing you to interact and manipulate objects. Nonprofits are already using virtual reality in exciting ways already. In Australia, Dementia Australia runs a training program called ED, where carers across their dementia centres train in interactive virtual reality, getting a first-hand experience of what it feels like to have dementia. Because by seeing the world through the eyes of someone with dementia, those carers are able to build empathy and ultimately deliver better care. Now let's talk about augmented reality. So augmented reality is a technology that overlays digital images or animations on top of a user's view of the real world, therefore enhancing or augmenting reality. Now, you are probably likely to have already used augmented reality in your daily life. For example, if you bought technology online or you bought furniture online, you may have been given that option to view the product in 3D or view it in your home, through your home, by placing the virtual object in your living room. Or you may have used a filter on your Instagram stories if you've ever um, put on a makeup mask or you've ever used one of those dog filters, then you've used augmented reality. Now, mixed reality is a combination of those two. It's a combination of AR and VR, bringing immersive technology to life. You can experience the benefits of virtual reality with pass-through technology. So you have those objects in front of you, but you can still see the real world around you. Today, charities and social causes are building for the metaverse for two main reasons. The first is transforming how you work. So collaboration, education and training and program delivery. The second is campaigning, so empathy building, uh, storytelling and fundraising. First, the future of work. Now virtual reality training, again Marty will talk about this himself, but it prepares workers to handle real life situations before they encounter them. This type of training helps businesses improve customer service, 
reduce bias in recruiting, spot, spot potential hazards in manufacturing, reduce technician error, and in some cases, even save lives. I'm working with an aid charity in the States right now who are building immersive training for their workers going into dangerous situations to ensure that everybody has the same high level of training, no matter what their training situation on the ground. Another great example of training is the American Heart Association. They've launched an app for CPR, which is targeted at first aiders in workplaces across America. The American Red Cross has recently released a VR training app for lifeguards as well. Let's see if this will just show you some of that as well. Now, what's exciting about this is this award-winning training simulation helps lifeguards practice their surveillance and drowning recognition and reinforce their cognitive skills through immersive training scenarios. This means that the quality of lifeguard training isn't dependent on local trainers, but is reinforced through high quality immersive experiences, which can be done in any place at any time. Now I want to think about fundraising and communications. A lot of the work that we do as charities is thinking about how to build empathy with our cause. Fundraisers are far better able to tell the story of the causes you support by exploring international projects and meeting donors in the metaverse. And you're able to do it totally ethically, not dependent on individuals sharing their personal stories. Immersive selling and storytelling in the metaverse can help organizations build empathy for their causes. So what you're seeing on the screen in front of you is um, a documentary that the World Wildlife Fund released in 2020. It's called Ecosphere. It's an immersive documentary showing the conservation crisis across the world. This documentary is available in VR, and I first came across it at a festival where WWF had a fundraising tent where they put festival goers in headsets to truly understand the climate crisis facing us and use the donation, uh, the technology to drive donation and sign ups. Because if your supporters can feel your cause, see your cause, experience your cause, it builds that immediate emotional connection. Take a look at our VR for Good website, um, which you can just find by Googling VR for Good, where you'll see some inspiration examples of VR driving social change. One example you'll see on there is Goliath, which is a 25 minute animated virtual reality experience, which helps players walk through the, the life of somebody with schizophrenia. Players move from scene to scene by completing games and learn more about living with schizophrenia. Because the more that we can understand what it feels like to live somebody else's life, the more that we'll see that, that cohesion and ultimately benefit for your cause. This year, we saw Save the Children UK release a 360 degree virtual reality film about the hunger crisis on the Horn of Africa, which is a vital tool in their campaigning with policymakers to make the crisis come to life and prompt action. And VR is also being used widely by organisations like libraries, schools and nonprofits to drive fundraising around capital projects. For those looking to raise a large amount of money for a specific item, we're seeing nonprofits build that item in VR first to encourage supporters to experience what that would look like, to engage their supporters into donating. So for instance, I'm working with some libraries who are able to, who want to extend, who want to raise money for capital project to build a new library, and they are able to um, build what that would look like in order that patrons of the library come along and can put their headsets on, see the benefits of having this new library, and then donate. What you're seeing in front of you is Pencils of Promise, which is a US nonprofit who used this tactic at a Wall Street gala, building a school in VR to encourage donors to give towards building it in real life. Right, we are almost at the end of our jam packed session today. It has truly been a whistle stop top, uh, a whistle stop top, a whistle stop tour of the metaverse. And I hope that it, um, it, the overview and an understanding of the potential for organizations has been useful. It is really hard to fit it all into one session, let alone a 10 minute session. 
some guidance for moving forward. This is a new technology and many people are still working out how it's going to work for them. It's totally fine if your strategy is just wait and see. But you should be thinking about it. The metaverse belongs to you. For the metaverse to become a reality, no single company can or should control it. We believe the metaverse will be the successor to the mobile internet. And we hope that the metaverse will be more like the internet than the mobile app stores of today. So the guidance is don't panic, but do stay curious. Do stay trying out the new technology. Do take on that creative mindset, explore the free tools that exist today, learn from the first movers, and keep on talking to us um, over at Meta and over at TechSoup about what this can mean for you. Uh, thank you so much. I'm going to pass you back over to Joe. awesome um i learned a lot about the metaverse and and all different types of things in the vr reality world thank you next we would like to go ahead and, and welcome one of our guest speakers martin schwartz from vehicles for change thank you joseph um thank you all for uh for being here today um we're really excited to to really kind of talk more about how virtual reality is being used in the nonprofit world specifically in the world of, uh, in, of uh, workforce development. So just to give you a little background, uh, you know, Vehicles for Change is a 25 year old nonprofit that I launched back in 1999, originally to address the two major issues that impact generational poverty, transportation and incarceration. So initially back in 99, we started developing a program where we take donated cars, we repair them, and then we award those to low-income families so that they can get to work, take care of their children, get them to after-school activities and grocery stores and doctor's appointments and all those type of things. 75% um, of our recipients, uh, as you can imagine, once they get a car, do much better in income um, and more so that their children are able to do the things that, that most parents take for granted who have a vehicle. Uh, next slide. <laughs> So our car program over the 25 years grew into the largest low-income car program in the country. Uh, you can see kind of the benefits of owning a car. I think most of you probably understand that. But in 2015, we launched what we call the Full Circle Auto Repair and Training Center. In that program, we train men and women, mostly coming directly out of incarceration to be auto mechanics. Uh, very successful program. Uh, we've trained more than 250 individuals uh, since 2015 with an 85% with an 80% completion rate, a 95% placement rate, and more importantly, less than three or only three of our individuals out of 250 are currently incarcerated, um, which is a recidivism rate of less than 1.5%. And as you think about individuals who are incarcerated, uh, it's it impacts the entire family. So children of individuals who are incarcerated have a 60% higher chance of being incarcerated than children of parents who have not been incarcerated. So again, looking at breaking the cycle of poverty. Well, as we grew our auto mechanic program, we started getting more and more feedback from employers that they wanted us to train more. Uh, at that time, the National Automobile Dealers Association joined our board of directors, Napa Auto Parts joined our board of directors, and COVID hit, and it was like, okay, we've got to basically slow down what we're doing. We can't train as many people. And fortunately, at that time, one of our board members uh, had been involved in the virtual reality world as a, uh, the head of U.S. sales for a company called Varo that sells very high-end uh, uh, headsets. Um, and we had a discussion about 
how can we look at our training program and make it more effective and yet more cost uh, efficient? And so the next slide. So we decided to develop a virtual reality auto technician training program. And we went to a company called HTX Labs out of Houston, Texas. And lo and behold, the United States Air Force had been using HTX Labs to develop their training for individuals to be Air Force technicians. So they were training Air Force technicians to work on $60 million jets. And so we kind of took a look at that and said, hey, you know what? If it's good enough for $60 million jets, it's got to be good enough for our program. So we worked with HTX Labs to create our first auto technician training, which is an entry-level training program. Uh, it is training an individual how to use a lift, if any of you are, are car, car folks, how to use a lift in a bay, how to do an oil change, how to use a tire balancer and tire changer, and how to do a brake job. Being in the field of, of training for a long time, we knew that these were the skills that could get somebody an entry-level job in automotive and get them prepared to move into that field without having to have hands-on, without having to have a car, without a tools, without any of the things that you need to launch a training program. Interestingly enough, at the time prior to doing this, Vehicles for Change was in an expansion mode to go national. We currently have four locations in Maryland and one in San Diego. They're all brick and mortar. Well, to open a brick and mortar training program, it cost us a million and a half just to launch a program for two years that would train 60 individuals. It's really those of you who run nonprofits, who raise money, who write grants, understand that that's a really tough model to sustain. So if we're running 20 of these across the country, you know, we're having to raise 10 to $14 million a year to sustain these programs. So when we started looking at the opportunity that virtual reality provided us, it allowed us to expand our program into new locations as opposed to a million and a half for two years, it's $60,000 for two years. And for $60,000, we can train 80 people over the course of those two years. Now, the trick was, as we got into this, is how do we get employers to buy in, right? This was a brand new technology. Uh, when we launched it about almost two years ago now, the feedback we're getting from employers is, oh, you can't train somebody using virtual reality. You got to get your hands dirty. You got to get your hands on a tool. And, you know, we're, we're trying to tell them, look, the Air Force is doing this to train million dollar jets, technicians on million dollar jets, there's got to be something to it. But it took us about a year and a half really to start to get people to buy into it. Um, we currently have it in the Maryland prison system and the Delaware prison system. It's in the Department of Juvenile Services in Maryland and Texas. Uh, we are in workforce programs now in two different states. Uh, and we finally got two major dealerships, one in Virginia and one in uh, Omaha, Nebraska, to use it to train their own technicians. And we're working with multiple other dealerships. And we have it now also in high schools and community colleges. So I think that if you start to think about how technical training is done in high schools uh, with hands-on and how uh, minimum use of technical training that we have in high schools, mainly because of the cost. It's not just a matter of building out a shop or having the equipment to do a welding program or HVAC, but then the challenge is how do I find instructors, right? I mean, we've been running vehicles for change in all these locations for quite a while, and yet we still have a hard time finding instructors. When one of our instructors retires, uh, it's very difficult to find somebody that has the skills and then can teach those skills. With virtual reality, you eliminate all those barriers. Uh, you eliminate the barrier of cost, of needing equipment, of having to find a car, of also, uh, and I think you heard Beth talk a little bit about, is the danger that you have in training, right? If you're doing welding training, you know, you can burn your place down. If you're doing automotive training, 
and you break a bolt off, you can you drop a tire, you can get hurt working on automotive, not to mention the fact that if you're working on a live car, now you have a situation where you're training somebody on a vehicle that someone has to drive. So you really eliminate all those barriers. Uh, as I said, we've been doing this now for over three years since we started to develop it. Uh, I've been in the training world for uh, more than nine years now. Uh, I sit on the Governor's Workforce Development Board. I sit on the Baltimore City Workforce Development Board. I, I am 100% convinced that this is the way that we're going to do all technical training in the next three to five years. Uh, it is more efficient. And then you think about we're actually working right now with putting this with individuals with disabilities and our conversation with individuals is that it is a much easier way for them to learn because it is totally immersive. It takes away all the possible distractions. It reduces training time significantly. And it is really going to be the way that, that we can train people uh, at a significantly lower rate and really kind of close that tech, uh, high tech training gap that we have across this country where the US uh, Department of Labor identified more than 750,000 openings for high tech skilled, te not high tech, but skilled trade jobs that will go unfilled this year simply because there's nobody filling. Uh, you know, we've got a tough job as nonprofits to take care of really the families that are most in need. And I think this is a way that we can turn around generational poverty and train th hundreds of thousands of people uh, much more efficiently and effectively. So thank you for being here, and I'm happy to answer questions at the end. Thank you, Martin, for sharing your story and your impact to, to, the, to your community and, and um, how you're using VR within your organization. Um, next, I would like to go ahead and welcome our next speaker, Christine Ellermore and Milad Mazari, and they are going to speak on um, incorporating emerging technologies into resettlement and integration. Thank you so much, Joseph. Hello, everybody. It's wonderful to be here. Um, we'll be talking about how we have integrated immersive learning into the resettlement service sector. So working with newcomers to the United States that are being resettled through uh, specifically the International Rescue Committee, which is one of the largest resettlement organizations. Um, next slide. And today uh, you have myself, Christine Nellermo. I'm a training officer for Switchboard, which is a project on IRC. Uh, to help with training and capacity building, but I was a previous uh, caseworker and in the field social worker working uh, with resettled, resettled um, communities. And my colleague is also on the call. Hi, uh, Milad Mazari. I teach at the University of Utah in the College of Architecture and Planning. All right, next slide. Um, and this project started in a partnership with the University of Utah, um, as well as the IRC, and has now gone to a national scale with Switchboard. Um, and I'll just kind of talk about that relationship with Switchboard um, real quick so you can kind of understand the reach of the project at this point, but I'll also go back to the origins of it. So next slide. Um, Switchboard is a uh, project that IRC manages that can support, um, you can go to the next slide, that'd be helpful. Um, it can support any resettlement agency in the United States, um, and we provide free technical and training assistance. And so um, any of you on the call that work with clients that can be funded or are eligible to be funded by the Office of Refugee Resettlement, so anybody who's new to the country, um, has a refugee status, or has had a refugee status at some point, could get technical training from us for free. Joseph, uh, are, am I able to move the slides forward? or? Maybe we can move the slides one more. Um, and I'll send those links here, but you can also access our technical training through that Switchboard website. And we'll go to the next and kind of go back to the origin stories of how Milad and I started this project. So back in 2019, um, we started with workshops at the University of Utah, bringing new refugee uh, youth to university settings and through kind of interactive workshops, exposing them to really exciting technology at the time. So 3D printers, virtual reality, and talking about different jobs and technology that exist 
um, and just how the university can support them in thinking and dreaming, maybe bigger than they've ever thought. And that was an amazing partnership with Rod. And we kind of grew that. I don't think a lot of you will be willing to talk about the COVID years of this project. Uh, no, but I will because COVID was not that great. Um, no, it was a it was an uh, interesting moment where technology became an accelerant for all of us, really. But we really wanted to leverage that moment in terms of uh, the collaboration Chrissy and I had started uh, initially before COVID, and really my position at the university, which was essentially to increase digital literacy for the student cohort. But I really wanted to see if I can increase the digital literacy in the larger community scope. So during COVID, we really thought about how, what are ways of telepresence or what are ways in which you can have alternate ways of providing programming now that we can't be in contact. And then also similar to demands and needs that people are talking about on this call ahead of uh, prior to us, um, with the, also the Afghan emergency response, the influx of people that were coming to Salt Lake City was so high that uh, we would have volunteers from our, uh, my research design studios go to the IRC and help with VR, implementing that and showing newly arrived clients of how uh, these modules that we had made were working. Chrissy, I'll hand it back to you. Yeah, and to kind of talk about the process of how we started making these VR modules, on the next slide, you'll see this uh, co-creative model that we implemented, um, working with design students at the university, service providers and caseworkers, working with new refugee arrivals, and then previous refugee arrivals themselves in this co-creative design uh, method. So we would listen to needs, think about how do we help, and community navigation came up as a really important need for newcomers. And so navigating buses, school for the first time, going to uh, a hospital or a clinic, and we would work in that co-creative model, which we used government, um, we used University of Utah funding to pay research affiliates that were formerly refugees to bring that lived experience into that model, and we would collectively create these 360 videos on navigating these places in our city. And that was Salt Lake City at the time. Um, and then finding community resources such as Meta, who donated some uh, heads up to us this year. So as we're scaling this across the nation, really uh, showing what we did in Salt Lake City to other places um, and helping them in that co-creative model, looking at specific needs to their localized community um, to create immersive environments for training and community navigation or whatever that need is that they are trying to address. And if we can jump to the next slide, um, and a lot of you on the call had already mentioned you know what VR is, and, and Beth did a great job providing that overview, but to be fully immersed in that setting, also, uh, we, we see it as a way to bypass some of that uh, trauma or fear that a lot of newcomers have as they're coming to a new community and a new place, having to learn all the systems of that place in a different language, different cultural norms. Um, VR gives uh, an initial step to be able to be immersed in that space, deal with some of those emotions of learning. So when you go to that bus for the first time or that clinic for the first time, hopefully you're a little more confident and feel a little more ready to learn. Milan? Yeah, um, building on previous notes too, I think uh, Beth showed a few beautiful cases of like what it's like to be in certain camps uh, at the Horn of Africa, for example. And we we noticed there's a lack of content creation after resettlement or after the uh, migration. And we really wanted to pick up the, the VR on that realm. And, and that involved a lot of realistic depictions, depictions of what happens after you come. And then I think I want to express the intentionality of using the Quest 3 here. Um, we were just currently at, uh, recently at GDC and sustainability is really important for us. So there's a lot of different brands uh, in terms of VR headsets, but 41% of like research that is being done is done on the uh, the, the meta headsets. And for us to scale and sus uh, sustainably grow, we really wanted to start that at the beginning, knowing what how could we actually grow? So I've, se I've seen things in the comments where people are talking about, we need this much to start out with. And we really just thought about that. And that's where the, the meta headsets really helped us. Um, but we started with phones and Google Cardboard, and we've just iterated and come to this place. And I think that's really be important to be transparent about. That's a great point. 
Yeah, and that's kind of that creative process when you're working with the resources you have. I think uh, someone on the call called it scrappy before. We're all nonprofits. Um, but we also want to expose new arrivals to emerging tech and really exciting new technology. Because if it's going to be ubiquitous, we are doing a disservice if we're only providing basic tech, smartphones, computers, affordable internet, but kind of all of it is digital inclusion. And, and it also creates like curiosity about a future where maybe some of these new rival, rivals want to explore careers in technology. And if you can't really explore something you haven't been exposed to. So it kind of gets that horizon flattening for emerging tech and it's not as hier hierarchical. But if we can move to the next. So in Salt Lake City, in our case study, uh, we would use, we uh, had a donation of 17 headsets from the University of Utah to start out for the Salt Lake City office. And we would use it in our cultural orientation trainings every month. So these are new arrivals that are in the country for the first three months in the US. Um, and we would show the different modules we discussed earlier, buses, clinics, hospitals, um, different apps. And we would use interpreters that would kind of collectively in a circle have a demonstration of somebody trying it on first and everyone's growing in curiosity and making uh, making some like, uh, I don't know, brave moves to try new technology in front of other people. And then collectively, they would share the headsets and go through these immersive experiences and then discuss it afterwards. And we were able to take a survey during this time of 140 new arrivals. And out of that 140, the average person um, rated one being not comfortable, five being very comfortable, an average of four comfortability in the headset as well as the environment. And so we have like initial data showing receptivity to uh, using emerging tech in these kind of new arrival programming spaces where folks are, are kind of learning everything through a fire hose in those first three months, hoping for that self-sufficiency and independence. Um, before I go on, Matt, did you want to add anything to that CO environment? Just in terms of the the screen here, there's, I think we've we've been really also open to spatial computing and spatial curiosity in the space and holding space for that in terms of the experiments that we do. That we always come back to VR being a really sustainable uh, contact point of technology for us to work in. That's a great point. And just kind of one slide on the data from our initial user testing uh, with newcomers. These were enumerated with interpreters and service providers. Um, that next slide, please, Joseph. Uh, a lot of people think of VR as for younger folks, or it's kind of new and, and not necessarily for every population. And I saw in the chat, there's some of you working with seniors um, in different communities like libraries, which are open to the entire public. Our data showed um, that it wasn't very different uh, folks comfortability in the headset out of one through five, five being the highest, that 59 to 63 year olds rated a 3.5 on average out of 140. And so I thought that was really interesting data that everybody loves to learn in an immersive, engaging ways. And VR really creates that. And it also creates some agency. In resettlement, a lot of the services are already dictated by the government and they have to happen fast in these short iterations. Um, and it's hard to, to go through programming that's programmed at you. And VR creates a space to kind of sit in an environment and take in all of the information slowly. You can even pause it and still be learning in that space. And so any agency that we can create in resettlement feels like a win. And VR has been really helpful in creating that um, for newcomers. And then our last slide, I mean, that'd be great if you can help me kind of bring it home. What, what our big goal and plans are for this is to really create localized design studios. Since we can work with um, any resettlement agency nationally and do some of these co-creative design sprints with them for tech, um, we would love to connect local resources to those groups and, and um, find research affiliates that can help in that process from, from a former refugee background and localize this design process uh, for cities. Um, yeah, no, uh, we've been really fortunate to do this in about five cities now, which is, is humbling, uh, I have to say. Um, and th that's really just putting trust in the, the process of that. It's a communal process and it's a community project. That co-creation wheel that we showed you, that at first was, I think, like 25 steps that we really just tried to figure out a way in which 
how its research design methods and community engagement work into a more simplified process here. Research affiliates, that's been something that we're doing with localized studios, uh, uh, people with lived experience being experts while learning new things. That's been a really strong suit of what we do. Um, we also think that there's a feedback loop in terms of how this tech is used. So um, it's not necessarily collecting uh, data in the process of using it, but also they're informing the ethics of it in which how these uh, th these forms of tech become sustainable to the point of Beth bringing up the internet, right? So that's really important in terms of how the, those things work. And then creating new socio-technological tools, how we really believe in the innovation in this space. It's not necessarily that there's one way to use this, but actually thinking what other add-ons could be on to the, the VR headset. How can you actually make more sustainable ways of actually scaling these things for different communities? And we've done this through conversations, trainings, um, as well as game jams or what we call place jams, where we just get experts from lived experience, technical leads, students come in and just really doing that. So those are things that we've uh, um, tried to find in terms of localized studios. And we, 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 again, humble that we've been able to do this in multiple cities. I know it started out as like a friendship collaboration, but now has a full-on program. So also I think when things start small and start with listening and start with really understanding a context of a place, um, there is already built-in sustainability in that. Um, and I just wanna close with one last thing. A lot of us are in nonprofits um, and the reality of resources is, is just the reality. Like they're limited and it's really a, a kind of a, crowded space. Um, but the thing, the only thing we really need support with is thinking through how do we find uh, pipelines for technology? Because all of our funding is government and government can't pay for technology and can't pay for some of these technical tools. And so if there's anyone on the call that has connections or collaboration or thinks of ways that we can maybe think through the expertise we can bring and maybe some resources they could bring, uh, we are open to those collaborate, collaborate Relations and partnerships. And so I just wanted to say that because there's a lot of folks in the call um, and you never know. And we like to start small and see how it grows. But thank you for this time. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Christy and Malad, um, for sharing your impact story and, and how you're using VR within your organization and your programs. All right, just, I just want to give a very quick overview because I'd like to leave some time for questions for um, our, our, our experts and also our, our fellow nonprofits that have fully emerged themselves in VR technology. Um, so in the TechSoup catalog, we do have um, the MetaQuest for nonprofits, and this is going to be the MetaQuest Pro VR headset. This is offered to eligible nonprofits at 76% discount. And you can find the eligibility in this um, in that eligibility hyperlink there, which will be included in the slide deck. Um, and then also we have another offering, which is MetaQuest for Business. This is a subscription bundle for MetaQuest devices that include essential admin features like user, device. Um, and application man management and also customer support. Um, this offering is offered to nonprofits at an 80% discount. And once again, you can find the eligibility here um, uh, it's with, with, through this hy hyperlink. All right. So, um, and last thing that I want to mention is just, you know, we do have a program. It's, it's called the Quad Program. And um, if you're using VR headsets and want to connect with other nonprofits and organizations that may also be learning how to incorporate emerging technologies in their operations, you should consider joining Quad. Um, it's a membership offer and platform that only provides benefits to your, to your organization in terms of events, discussions, and products but also provides a community platform to engage with other nonprofits like yours on various areas of practice and purpose. So um, once again, here's the hyperlink. If you would like to learn more about Quad, this will be included in the deck that we will send you in roughly three business days. All right. Well, thank you everybody for um, joining us today. Let's go ahead and open the chat room for any questions for our panelists, um, for our experts, for our, our fellow nonprofits. Um, looking here, so I do see one. Um, let me just read this. I'm so sorry. 
So we are an adult literacy nonprofit that works mostly with English language learners. We have six, uh, I missed it, sorry. Um, and Joe, just noting that in the Q&A option, we have a few coming up too. So if you want, I can read through those as well while you're going navigating. Um, so there's one from Kevin who says, given the vast possibilities of VR and AR technology, is there a dedicated contact at Meta who can work directly with nonprofits? Specifically, I'd like to share my vision of my nonprofit, Creative Vets, to understand what kind, what we can and cannot do with VR and guidance on how to achieve our goals. And I think in general, Beth, it'd be great to understand like how organizations can start thinking about it and who they can partner with potentially in some of the partners that you might have to help think of custom software that might support them as well. Yeah, of course. Um, <clears throat> thank you for the opportunity to talk about this. So when, when you're thinking about nonprofits and reality, that's reality at Meta, it's me. You're looking at her. It's uh, This is the whole team. So if there's a person to talk to, it's me. Um, what I'm going to do is send out via Joseph. I will send out some office hours um, and a sign-up sheet. So I know that sounds very high school, but bear with me. Um, there are millions of nonprofits in the world. So if we could, um, maybe we could work together in that way where you can set up some time and then we can have a conversation um, about your organization. I know there's other people on this call, Robert from Thrive. I see you, I hear you, I know I owe you an email. Maybe we can set up the same process, but let's have that conversation. Um, there's a next question about the approximate cost for the sighting equipment, VR headset software. I think that's kind of been answered in a roundabout way by Christy and the lad. Let's not start by thinking about the technology. You can go out and spend a billion dollars on the technology. Start with, like, what is the problem? What are you trying to solve at your nonprofit? Is it employee training? Is it program delivery like Marty? Is it, you know, we're in a, we're in a pinch. We need to scale. We need to be able to do this in a way that we can't currently. Start with the problem and then work out where the answer is from that. If you're as old as me, you remember the early days of that internet where suddenly everybody wanted to build an app. The answer to everything was an app. Everybody had to build an app. An app is an answer to very, very few things. What you need to do, you know, often the answer is a post-it. So start with what the problem is and then work out what technology you need to answer that. My suggestion to a lot of people is get your hands on a couple of headsets, get used to them, use them, use them with your people, use them with your service users and help them decide what you need and what you need to build. Um, you don't necessarily need to build something bespoke. There's loads of content out there that you can repurpose. The thing I love about IRC is that they got like a cheap 360 camera and made videos that they put on YouTube. It doesn't have to cost a million dollars for it to be really effective for your organization. Um, I think that's, that's it. Joseph, to hand back to you. Sounds good. Hey Joe, if I can if I can step sure. in on cost a little bit for those folks who are looking, you know, like us to develop their own program. Um, you know, the beauty of using HTX Labs is what they did for us is they built for us a virtual garage. Looks very much like the garage in my training center, uh, except for it only has one lift instead of eight. And in that virtual garage, my instructors are able to go in with the meta headset click record, and they record a lesson on how to do an oil change. And the software that HTX Labs developed for us turns that lesson into a student interactive. So now the student can watch the, the lesson on how to do an oil change. Then they go in and they actually go through how to do an oil change themselves with some supports on how, you know, there's the steps of how to do an oil change up when you have to take the oil pan plug out, the oil pan plug is flashing blue. And then the next stage is you go through and you do the oil change yourself and you get immediate feedback on how well you did, which is perfect for learning, right? As an instructor for years, uh, you know, the key is, is being able to give instant feedback. So if you're looking to develop kind of your own system, if there's nothing out there, um, there is a cost, but I think it's easier now to find foundations that are willing to fund that. We were able to get funding uh, from a foundation to pay for our development. Uh, our initial development was $150,000. Uh, HTX Labs gave us a tremendous break on that. Um, it is a little bit more than that, but it's certainly less than the million and a half it would have cost me to open one garage.
All right, thank you so much. And then I see an anonymous attendee has posted, can we order Quest 3 on, on TechSoup soon? Um, Beth, do you wanna answer that? Yeah, so the answer is not right now. Um, as you know, the Quest Pro is our most advanced headset, especially for organizations. Um, but what we're doing with TechSoup is like we're right at the beginning of this journey together. We this is we've got one product and it has a whole bunch of products. We've got one product on with TechSoup, and we've been really, really, really pleased with the reaction from nonprofits to us putting this on. Um, you know, it's given me all the evidence I need to be able to scale this program across different products. So the answer is like there's no firm date, but our ambition and intent absolutely is to bring more products online. All right, thank you. And I do have another question from Jasmine Hall. Um, we have invested in 12 headsets and is currently subscribing to platforms we do desire to create our own. Please share best practices, the practices fundraising to raise the funds and develop as well. Maybe I could kick that off and then pass it over to the experts. Um, <laughs> certainly Marty being the expert. My, my answer to that, because I get asked it a lot, is there is no one person out there that is funding VR. If you start with thinking about like, what is your strategic challenge as an organization? And you build your case around that as both nonprofits on air have done. This is how, you know, being really clear in your case for funds that this is how it's going to solve the social problem we are approaching. Then you're able to go to your existing funders. Uh, there is no magic like the VR money tree but if you can showcase that what you're doing is going to save you money in the long term, it's going to have greater social impact, et cetera, you're able to fish in the existing waters that you already get your um, funding from. Yeah, but I thought I, I agree with you. I think that, you know, for those of you who are looking to raise money, um, the foundations are just starting to get a feel for virtual reality. Uh, we just got a very nice grant from Truist Bank to expand our program into North Carolina and Florida using VR in the prisons. Um, so I, I think the key is, you know, if, you, if you're used to writing grants, there's always that question of sustainability. There's always the question of cost. When I was writing grants for our training program and the cost was sixteen to $20,000 a person, I could see the foundations gagging a little bit, even though they some of them funded it and a lot of them funded it. But all of a sudden, I'm writing a grant and I can tra train just as many people for $750 to $2,000 a person. Uh, they're a lot more acceptable to those kinds of programs, especially if you can show how it's going to be so much more efficient. Um, and please feel free to use Vehicles for Change as an example when you're writing for a grant that this is what we're doing. It's being used in, in prisons and getting people jobs. Um, I think as we grow the field and start using it more, uh, more and more foundations will be accepted to uh, looking at funding this type of a program. All right, thank you both for your, your answers. Um, we do have another question that has come in. How can you use VR in children's literatures, in children's literature in indigenous languages? I mean, that's a big question, isn't it? Um, that's a bit, I, I sound like such a boring broken record. That is if you can hear me at all. But essentially, it's not really about your subject uh, matter. It's genuinely about what it is you're trying to achieve. So for instance, if it's about getting children immersed in storytelling, then maybe it's a case of making <clears throat> an, uh, an AR experience where you know, they put it on and they're walking around their bedroom and their favorite characters jump out of them. I have no sense of what, what the real focus is. Um, but tell you what, let's let, let you come, to, come to the office hours and we can, we can brainstorm it together. Perhaps other people on the call have another idea to that, but really it's, it's going back to like, what are you trying to achieve within children's literature and indigenous literature? May I give a, answer actually it's one of the things that uh, really inspired me when I was a younger teacher was looking at historical preservation models and there was this phrase called digital digital diasporas 
that there were islands of pockets of communities, indigenous communities around the world that were working with digital tools for ages, but they didn't know that other people were also working with digital preservation tools. And more recently, I know that um, there's more exhibitions around preservation of indigenous culture, and maybe sound is a format in VR that works well. If it is children's literature, that could work well. And also, I know there is indigenous knowledge of plants that are being fed into um, AI models now that are, that are essentially working in, in ways that you can actually preserve that model in AI format. So I think there's different ways of preservation that have come about in these tools and virtual tools in the last 15 years that might be actually a good precedence to jump off from. All right. Well, thank you so much for um, to our, our speaker, our, our, our experts, our nonprofits for sharing their, their case studies. And most importantly, thank you to all of our attendees for coming uh, and joining us today to learn more about virtual reality and, and the future. Um, we will be sending out, I just want to remind you guys, we will be sending out um, the, the slide deck with um, all hyperlinks included, also um, speaker, speaker contact information. Um, Beth has also offered um, some office hours, so we will, we will include that as well. If we didn't get to your question today, um, uh, please bring that to, you know, please feel free to reach out to the speaker you think or our panelists that you feel would be able to answer that question uh, for you. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, so much, and um, have a good day. Thank you so much. So, Joseph, since you have host power, you have to hit end all for everybody because I can't do it. Where's where's thank end you. all? At the bottom, where it says um, leave.